Good evening, uh, Mr. Director of the Greek Consulate, uh, Mr. Representative of the, of the Ambassador, uh, members of Friends of Society. Thank you all very much for coming here tonight to this event. Uh, okay, right. So welcome everybody to this event tonight. Um, I'm glad to see a lot of our regular people, as well as some new faces tonight, which is very nice. And I hope you will all enjoy this event, and I'll see, we'll see you again in our future events uh, next year. Uh, talking about future events, you may have seen an advert for our Christmas ball somewhere over there. Uh, our ball will be held this year again in the usual place, the Royal Garden Hotel in Kensington on the 14th of December, and we'd like to see as many of you as possible in this event. Uh, there are some leaflets available for you in the reception desk if you want to pick up one, or if you want to ask us after the event, we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Uh, let me say a few words about tonight's event and why we're doing this. Um, we all know that Alexander the Great is famous as a fierce warrior and a person who conquered a lot of the ancient world. But we want to focus not only on his uh, fighting abilities, but on his uh, plan to unite the world and, and spread Hellenic culture over the ancient world. So one of the, one of the ways he tried to do that is, was through currency and coins. Uh, he tried to unite all of his uh, area with his common coins and common currency so people could trade and uh, fill as part of the same empire. And tonight we want to focus on that aspect of his legacy, which is, for me, far more important than his uh, legacy as a conqueror or a fighter. And for that, we have an excellent panel of three people from different backgrounds, but all of them are experts in Alexander and in Macedonia and coins. And they will give you a very, uh, a very interesting background and uh, three different perspectives on the same subject. Uh, so before we begin, uh, let us uh, first learn a bit more about our speakers tonight and I'll hand you over to Mr. Apostolou who will read a short biography for each of the speakers. Thank you. Uh, good, uh, good evening. Thank you for, for coming. I'm going to introduce our uh, panelists today so you can have a better idea about their lives. Uh, first. Uh, for um, Andrew Meadows, uh, Professor of Ancient History, Tutorial Fellow, New College, Oxford. Um, Andrew Meadows is a specialist in the history, numismatics, and epigraphy of the Hellenistic Greek world. From 1995 to 2007, he was curator of Greek coins at the British Museum. In 2007, he became Margaret Thompson curator of Greek coins at the American Numismatic Society. From 2008 and 2014, he was deputy director of the society. In 2014, he moved to Oxford to take up a professorship and the tutorial fellowship in ancient history at New College. In October 2014, he was elected to the board of trustees of the American Numismatic Society. From 1998 to 2006, he was, secret he was secretary of the British Academy Silogae Numorum Grecorum Committee and in 2013, he was appointed director of the International SMG Project. From 2002 to 2005, he served as an honorary secretary of the Royal Numismatic Society. Um, in 2007, he was a member of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. In 2012, he was elected to the Crave Visitorship at Wilson College and the Robertson Visiting Scholarship in the Hebden Coin Room of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. <clears throat> in 2014 and 5, he was the Archaeological Institute of America's Metcalfe Lecturer. In July, in July 2015, he was elected to a honorary curatorship of the Schmoling Museum and in September 2015 as a member of the International Numismatic Council. He's a co-director of the online cones of the Roman Empire, also known as OCRE. Uh, and is currently working on a collaborative project to, to digitize the inventory of Greek coin hoards and is co-founder and a member of the steering committee of the Nomisma project. 
Professor Meadows has also taught Greek and Roman numismatics at, as an adjunct professor for Columbia University in New York and is working with the Institut Européen d'Archéologie Sous-Marine uh, at the Oxford Center of Maritime Archaeology on the publication of material from the excavations at Heraklion, East Canopus and Alexandria in Egypt. Um, for Dr. Our next panelist is Dr. Frédéric uh, Duria. I suppose my French is good enough to pronounce it correctly. Uh, uh, Frédéric Duria is director of the Department of Coins, Medals and Antiques of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Uh, from 2001 to 2009, she was assistant professor in Greek history at the University of Orléans and member of the Institut Universitaire de France between 2006 and 2009. From 2010 to 2013, she was curator of Greek coins in the Department of Coins, Medals and Antiques of the um, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and she was offered the position of director of this department in September 2013. She has been associated researcher to the Institut de Recherche sur les Arches Matérieux, Centre Ernest Babylon, a physics laboratory, specialized in elemental analysis of the metal of coins. That's between 2002 and 2013. And she's now associated to the research team Oria et Méditerranée, Monde Sémitique, Sorbonne University, and the École, and the École Doctorale Archéologie of the University of Paris I, uh, the Parthenon Sorbonne. She presented a habilitation uh, a dirigé de Recherche at the Sorbonne in 2010, published by the American Numismatic Society in 2016, uh, Wealth and Warfare, the Archaeology of Money in Ancient Syria, and published a monograph on a Phoenician city, Arados Hellenistique, Etude Historique et Monétaire, that was published in Beirut in 2005. Most recently, she co edited the volume Alexander Great, A Linked Open World. She's the editor of the collection. Trésor Monétaire, published by the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and is one of the directors of the Revue Numismatique, the Numismatic Review, and member of the board of the Société Française de Numismatique. She has written and edited 11 books and several dozens of articles related to numismatics and ancient history or economic history. Well, um, last but not least, uh, Mr. Dr. Simon Glenn, um, who is a research fellow in the Heberden Coin Room at the Eshmolen Museum of Art and Archaeology at the University of Oxford. Educated at the Universities of Edinburgh and Oxford, he works on both Greek and Roman coins and has recently also held a position as a curator of the numismatic collection of the University of Leeds. His doctoral research, which focused on the coins produced by the Greco-Bactrian kings who ruled in Central Asia in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, will be published very shortly as a book. Money and Power in Hellenistic Bactria. Dr. Glenn has a member of Oxford Paris Alexander Project, digitizing and publishing online the coins of Alexander the Great in the Eshmolen collection. He co-edited the volume Alexander the Great, a leaked open world to which he contributed papers on the coins struck under Alexander at Damascus and the topical issue of looting of cultural heritage in Syria and Afghanistan. He has also worked on Roman coin hoards pre-Roman coins of Spain, it has recently been awarded a grant by the British Academy to study the coins produced in the east of Alexander's empire at Babylon. Dr. Glenn is a fellow and a member of the Council of the Royal Numismatic Society. Uh, I think we should give a hand to our panelists for coming here so far. And I'm looking forward to hearing them talk now. <laughs> Well, I should begin by saying a, a very warm thank you um, for those uh, equally warm introductions and welcomes. So just, just to introduce briefly uh, how we're going to uh, arrange uh, this evening's uh, presentations, I'll be speaking to you first on the, uh, the topic um, you can see in front of you, uh, what is an Alexander, offering you an introduction to the phenomenon of the coinage of Alexander the Great, both in his lifetime and after. I'll then be handing over to Dr. Duira, who will be talking to you about the, the, the very exciting uh, question of the gold coinage of Alexander the Great and some really, really fascinating new discoveries that have been made um, about 
uh, where it comes from. And then finally, uh, Dr. Glenn will be finishing by moving us way out into the east to take a look at the, uh, the way in which uh, Alexander's influence really made itself felt uh, at the far end of his empire. Um, which brings me, of course, to the question of Alexander's empire. As we've already heard uh, this evening, it was big. Alexander conquered the world everywhere from, of course, Macedonia uh, over here in the west, right the way through to the Indus Valley in the east. How did he do for this? How did he do this? And how did he pay for it? Well, he didn't start from a good place. According to the uh, historian Arian, um, uh, Alexander explained to his soldiers that inheriting from my father only a few gold and silver cups and not so much as 60 talents in the treasury, with debts Philip had contracted of about 500 talents, I myself borrowed another 800 in addition. He didn't receive a great deal from his father other than debts, at least as he put it. Uh, the Roman biographer Plutarch, uh, in his life of Alexander, um, tells a similar sort of story. To provision these forces, Aristobulus says, he had not more than 70 talents. Duris speaks of maintenance for only 30 days, and Onesicritus says he owed 200 talents. Besides, again, painting a picture of an Alexander who set off on this world context conquest with virtually no money but an awful lot of debt. We can contrast that with what the literary sources tell us about the amount of money Alexander acquired as he conquered the Persian Empire uh, at uh, Aspendos and, and uh, Soli, uh, 100, 200 talents, 3,000 talents when he got to Damascus, 4,000 or 3,000 talents when he got to Arbela, 50,000 at the, uh, the Persian capital of Susa, and 120,000 at the nearby capital of Persepolis. Some 183,000 tons uh, of silver, um, if we equate it all to silver, um, it was a mixture of gold and silver, as we'll be hearing later, or well, that's about 4,765 metric tons of silver. That is a considerable amount. If we compare the amount that Alexander started with, that's the little sliver of yellow, and how much he had by the time he'd finished, it's pretty impressive. Alexander set off without the wherewithal to conquer or own this empire and ended up with, it seems, plenty. And he needed it. Here are some estimates of Alexander's salary bill in 334. He probably had about 45,000 infantry and cavalry, about 44,000 men on ships, and was paying them about a drachma a day or he was getting through money at about 15 talents per day, 450 a month, or 5,400 talents per annum. That, over the space of the 12 years of his conquest, would come to about 65,000 talents in total. Let's hold that figure in our heads, 65,000 talents for a moment. I'm going to come back to it. What did he do with all this money? that he acquired from Persian treasuries in order that he could pay his troops, pay all these men, well, of course, he turned it into coinage. And he turned it into very, very large quantities of coinage. We are fortunate in that we have a wonderful reference work uh, for this coinage. Um, if you want to go away and start exploring this for yourself, you can acquire a copy of this book. It's the British Museum catalogue, the coinage and name of Alexander the Great. Even better now, however, you can consult an online resource. This is Pella, which provides this for free on the World Wide Web, a complete account of every known type, or at least known to Martin Price. 
and there is the address for it if you want to scribble that down or indeed open it up now on your tablets and phones and start playing numismatics.org forward slash Pella. What will you see if you go there? You will see an account of the coinage. You will see maps showing you where uh, uh, the coin was produced. Uh, you will see maps of fine spots if they are known. And you will see a link to specimens in multiple collections. The coins in Oxford, in Paris, uh, in London, in New York, in the major collections. Um, uh, can be can be accessed there. So if you want to find out more about the coinage of Alexander the Great, there's a great resource for you. The coins he issued were in three metals, and this itself was a remarkable innovation that really had begun with uh, Philip of Macedon, his father. There were gold coins uh, in various denominations. I put them up for you there. For the most part. They have this simple type of the head of Athena on one side and Nike on the other. The warrior goddess and the goddess of victory and the goddess of victory holding the mast of a ship, symbolizing here victory on both land and sea, you might say. The silver coins, very largely of one type, with a head of Heracles in a lion scalp on one side and a seated figure of Zeus on the other. The message is there about Alexander's ancestry, back to Heracles, and about his kingship, and a kingship that derived perhaps from Zeus. Alongside the gold and the silver, there were also there are other silver types of various sorts produced uh, largely in Macedonia itself, um, with a variety of uh, symbols, uh, mounted figures, uh, the eagle of Zeus uh, appearing on some of these or drawing on the same sorts of messages, it seems. And there were bronze coins produced also in Macedonia and beyond, often mirroring the types of other coins or of earlier coins of his father. These are the coins of Alexander the Great. Where they were produced and when they were produced, we will come back to in a moment. One interesting feature of this coinage I do want to draw attention to um, uh, up front is the way it was produced. Coinage is familiar to us, obviously, as a medium today. It's produced by machines. In the ancient world, it was produced by hand. It was produced by hitting one die that was placed on top of a blank piece of metal, which was in turn placed on another die. And those dies were hand engraved, so everyone looks a little different. One of the things that numismatists do is collect lots and lots of coins and try to count the number of dies that were used to produce a coinage. Now that's all good, clean fun. It's like spot the difference. It's, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing that we can while away many happy hours doing. It has the advantage for us that it allows us to say how big a coinage was. If we can count the number of dies, we can say it was produced from, let's say, 100 dies or 1,000 dies. And from there, we can even try to guess how many coins were produced from each die. 10,000, 15,000, for example. And that means by counting the dies and by multiplying by uh, numbers of uh, coins uh, produced from a die, we can come up with estimates for the amount of coinage Alexander produced. And here are some estimates. These are based on slightly different uh, suppositions about numbers of dies. These are all the ranges we think somewhere between 10 and 14, uh, 1,400 dies for the gold, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,500 for the tetradrams, and somewhere between 3,000 and 3,600 for the drams. And these are all figures that were calculated by a French, uh, Belgian numismatist uh, called Francois de Calatay. And you can see if we multiply these out by these figures per die, we end up with figures between 65,000 and 90,000 talents in total. And if you've held that figure from earlier in your heads of circa 65,000 talents 
of currency needed over 12 years, you can see that this actually looks rather similar. So it looks like Alexander was indeed producing huge numbers of coins to pay these salary bills and perhaps even more to pay for all the other things that he needed as he went. There, at any rate, is what we can do in talking about the sheer size of Alexander's coins. There were so many because they were produced in so many places. Here is a map showing you all the places where coins in the name of Alexander the Great and with the designs of Alexander the Great were produced. The red marks mints that opened and produced in Alexander's lifetime. And you can see, obviously, there are mints up in Macedonia, but there are also mints that basically trace the route of his conquest. So as he went, Alexander opened up new mints, and at every single one, pretty much, the coins looked identical. And that was also a massive innovation. Nobody had ever done this before, which meant there was an empire with one coinage everywhere. So not only did he issue masses of coin, he issued it everywhere in his empire, and it all looked the same. And this, of course, became transformational. And you can see that from the blue dots. Those are places where coins that look like Alexander's were minted after his death. So the coinage of Alexander the Great is something that doesn't just belong to Alexander, but it becomes his legacy in monetary terms. Here is just a, a, a breaking down of these by region. I'll come back to this uh, in a moment. Uh, but you can see we've got Macedonian mints, we've got Greek mints, we've got Western Asia Minor mints, we've got African mints, Southern Asia Minor, Cyprus, the Levant, the broader East, and the Black Sea, and I've just color-coded those. We can break them down into periods of production too, uh, essentially from his lifetime, 333, down to 324, uh, his death in 323, uh, and right the way down to coins still being produced in the first century BC, 200, 200 years plus after Alexander's death. Can we tell the difference? Yes. Here is what coinage looks like from Alexander's lifetime. Neat, tidy, elegant, I think you would have to say. Here is what it looks like about 100 years later bigger coins, it's getting much more exotic, much more florid, we're getting a, 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 a good deal more character in some senses put into these coins, down to the, uh, the, the last issues which are really quite baroque, extraordinarily different, you wouldn't, there's no chance that you would mistake that for that. So we have a very clear development. Um, here is just an overview of how that develops in terms of the metal and you can see instantly that silver continues uh, in uh, production throughout this period. Gold and bronze are very largely confined to the time of the lifetime and the immediate successors of Alexander. Here is the, the map of our regions again, which I use just for the purpose of uh, showing you this uh, final slide which is to show how, in geographical terms, this phenomenon developed. So in Alexander's own lifetime, we have, it seems, the very largest quantity being produced back home in Macedon. That's the dark blue. As we move into the period after Alexander's death, a period of some confusion and uh, turmoil militarily, Asia Minor becomes the, the location, it seems, of uh, the predominant production. And that remains as a pattern um, in uh, the, the following a generation or so. After this point, we get a, a bit of an oscillation. Asia Minor continues to be important and indeed predominant as we move down into the late second, uh, late third and second century BC. But we can see also that by the end, this is entirely a phenomenon of the Black Sea. Um, to do, it seems, 
uh, in part at least, with uh, the, uh, the conflict that broke out between the, uh, the last kings uh, in that part of the world, particularly uh, Mithridates VI and Rome. So this coinage that Alexander created uh, moved through time, it moved through space, and it remained a coinage um, that was uh, desirable and used um, by royal powers for 250 years after his death. And there I'm going to bring it to a close and say thank you for listening so far. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Dujia. Thank you. So um, I will only speak of one part uh, of the coinage of Alexander. Uh, currently, as a study is going on, so it's not a final state uh, that I will show you. And um, to understand the, the place of uh, the gold coinage of Alexander, it is useful to start with a general view of the place of gold uh, at the currency in the, in the Greek world. So I will do that uh, as an introduction. Um, one of the oldest material traces of gold uh, being used as a mean of exchange was found in Eritrea uh, in uh, the excavations uh, of a house by uh, the Greek archaeologist P.G. Uh, Themelis, uh, and it had that, that shape. Uh, it was, in fact, um, 510 grams of gold and uh, electrum, an alloy of gold and silver, uh, buried uh, in a house uh, in a ceramic. The ceramic uh, and uh, the archaeological layers allow us to date it to the uh, 8th century. Uh, it was first interpreted at um, the uh, goldsmith uh, deposit until Georges Lorida suggested that it could be, uh, in fact, uh, a hoard of weight gold, which means uh, a hoard uh, of gold used as the mean of exchange, as we know, uh, hack silver uh, in the Middle East, uh, where, uh, the, where silver was used as a mean of exchange uh, weight. In both cases, we have scraps um, jewels cut broken pieces of metal uh, that were adapted to um, the weight you needed uh, at the time of an exchange. And it's why uh, Jack Roll suggested to call the Eritrea hold uh, a gold, um, a hag gold uh, hold. If this interpretation is right, uh, the Eritrea hold would be the earliest gold money hold in the Greek world. Uh, not, of course, the earliest gold hoard, because uh, we have other hoards of uh, gold objects, uh, but in that case, we really have a mean of exchange. One century after the burial of the Eritrea uh, hoard, uh, the Greek uh, and the legion in Asia Minor started in Eastern coins. Uh, here again, gold play, uh, plays a major role, because the first uh, coins of the Greek world were well made of electrum again, so it is alloy of uh, gold and silver. Uh, and from there, uh, the use of co coinage expanded in the Greek world, mostly uh, with silver. Gold remained a specific issue of a limited number of mints. Um, this is uh, extremely obvious when you consider uh, the map uh, of all the Greek mints uh, that we currently know. Uh, this map plots uh, all the mints we have in, collect in the collection uh, at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and we have a fairly big uh, collection that covers most of uh, all the mints of uh, the Greek world. Uh, the Greek world, as you see, is very extended because it goes from uh, Portugal uh, to India and to south, from southern Russia to uh, Egypt. Uh, in comparison, the mints issuing gold uh, in the Greek world are a much more limited a number, uh, 113 in the collection in Paris, which is more or less 10% uh, of all the, the, the Greek mints uh, that we have. And it is uh, in this context that uh, the um, uh, conquest of Alexander occurs. So the second question is, um, where does the metal uh, issued by Alexander comes from? 
uh, the general agreement among historians is that Alexander minted the huge quantities uh, of uh, precious metals that he found in Persian treasuries, and you have seen uh, the, the tables uh, with the figures that we know. What is interesting is that uh, the Archimedes Empire was extremely um, wealthy, and we know that Persian kings had gathered uh, big amounts uh, of precious metals. But what is more interesting uh, for my purpose here is to consider the way they stored it. And Herodotus uh, has been fundamental in our understanding because he explained that the tribute is stored by the king in this fashion. He melts it down and pours it into earthen vessels. When the vessel is full, he breaks the earthenware away and when in his money cuts as much as will serve his purpose. As a result, um, historians have considered that uh, the Persian kings uh, were uh, well, barbarous people keeping riches uh, locked in their palaces. Uh, this is quite old fashioned of considering the uh, Achaemenid Empire economy, but there is still a debate about this circulation of, uh, or absence of his circulation of these riches uh, in this empire. It's why I like to quote Strabo, which is often forgotten when people quote Herodotus, because Strabo very um, gives more, more details and he, he says that, yes, uh, the Achaemenids uh, prefer uh, gold for, uh, to, to, um, as articles of equipment and not much uh, in money. But he mentioned the fact that they, when they needed it, uh, they could coin it uh, <clears throat> as suffices their needs. Uh, but, oh, sorry, and, uh, to quote the last sentence, and they coin only that mo what money is commensurate with their expenditure. Um, so this co if coinage it, it were, uh, that means there was also circulation, we will see it in a minute. Uh, the second point is that, of course, it's gold comes from somewhere. Uh, Herodotus, again, uh, in the tribute list, uh, mentions two people uh, providing gold uh, to the Achaemenid uh, king. The Indians provide huge amounts uh, every year, 360 talents of gold dust. And the Ethiopians, which is probably Nubia for her, uh, unrefined gold too. And there are also um, cuneiform texts, the foundation charters of Susa, mentioning gold coming from uh, Sardis, so in India, and from Bactria. And uh, this text also mentions the goldsmith of the king, who comes from Sardis again, and from Egypt. Fortunately, we have more sources, uh, either uh, through text or through archaeology, uh, showing that uh, the, the, there were mining area, more mining areas uh, around the Mediterranean that could provide gold too, uh, mostly uh, in Thrace, the uh, Pangaean region, uh, the Stiffness Island, uh, the Pactolus uh, in Lydia, and the Eastern Desert. Uh, in Egypt, I won't mention the Western uh, European, uh, Western Mediterranean uh, mines because uh, they are not involved uh, in Alexander's uh, gold issues. So this metal circulated and it circulated quite a lot uh, in the Mediterranean area. I just mentioned uh, the two main uh, issues before Alexander the Great: the gold directs uh, issued in the name of the great kings, in, probably in Sardis and the electrum status of Sisychus. That has a very interesting uh, area, uh, area of circulation because the Sisychus electrum is mostly found in holes uh, in the, uh, Aeg Aeg the Aegean and uh, the Black Sea, while uh, the Daricks are more thousand. Uh, and you will see that uh, it has, uh, in the long-term um, long study, uh, an importance. Uh, Andrew Meadows already mentioned what Alexander says in this table. I've plotted the same figures, but according to the metals. It's interesting to note that uh, in Diodorus and Curtius, the biggest amounts mentioned do not separate silver from gold. It's, it's a bit for us, uh, but uh, we, we cannot say exactly which part of it was, um, was made of gold. Uh, as a result, when Alexander uh, had enough metal, uh, he started issuing coins. The thing is that he didn't start with his own times. In fact, the third metal that he, uh, he struck 
was in the name of his father. Uh, you have here a stator of uh, Philip II, for which we uh, benefit from uh, the uh, complete study by Georges Lorida, who uh, provide us with a, a huge dye study, which is quite a unique for royal coinages. Uh, this dye study is very interesting because uh, it allows us uh, to understand better uh, the rhythm of production of these coins. Uh, thanks to text, we know that uh, Philip II started uh, producing gold stat stators after uh, taking uh, the mines uh, uh, of the region of Crenitus in, uh, in, on the Thracian coast. So that means after 357. And the, big, the king also began issuing coins uh, called Philippeian at this time, says uh, Diodorus. Plutarch, in his uh, Life of Alexander, uh, mentioned the fact that Philip commemorated the victory of his child at the Olympic Games on his coins. It's what you have on the reverse of this coin. So, which gives us um, um, a period between 356 and 344 for the beginning of these issues. As a result, uh, the dye study of uh, Georges Lorider allows us uh, to understand that, in fact, it's mostly Alexander who issued this Philips. You see that the production uh, uh, in the first group here, that his uh, Philip lifetimes is quite uh, low. Well, quite low, it's not that low because the value uh, of the gold stator is so high, but compared to what happened during Alexander lifetimes, you have uh, the dice, uh, number of die uh, with uh, this column and the number of coins here, uh, it's quite enormous. Uh, so, in fact, uh, Alexander the Great started issuing coins with his own uh, types uh, and, uh, and name relatively l uh, late, uh, only after uh, the uh, siege of uh, the Phoenician city of Tyre between January and July 332. Uh, th yeah, 332. Um, there has been a debate about, um, with, uh, among numismatists about these dates, but uh, uh, it's probably linked to the um, siege of Tyre for a very good reason. Uh, you see that the reverse of this coin shows uh, a, a victory, uh, and this victory, this rich victory, holds, uh, helps um, uh, a wreath, um, but also this strange object that you will see better here. It's a, it's a stylus. A stylus uh, was a standard on a boat on which the name of the boat was written. And it was removed from the boat uh, by um, the, uh, the winner of a um, naval battle. So very clearly, this victory is in fact mentioning uh, a, a naval victory of Alexander the Great. And it would be a, a very rare uh, occasion to commemorate an historical event on a Greek coin. Most of the time, uh, Greek coins don't commemorate historical events. So, uh, it's the reason why uh, these coins I did are dated after the siege uh, of uh, Tyre. During that siege, um, the Phoenician fleets uh, from all the northern uh, cities uh, of Phoenicia uh, relied Alexander, and after them, all the Cypriots uh, fleet. So that means that after uh, the victory against Ty, Alexander was the master of the seas for the first time in the conquest, which was, of course, very important to allow him to enter at the continent without having to worry about what was happening uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, one of the uh, interesting aspects of the uh, gold system of Alexander the Great is that it's quite complex. You have here uh, a stator, uh, but you also issued double staters, so large and uh, very beautiful uh, coins weighing uh, 17.20 grams. Uh, they have been considered for a long time as uh, some sort of commemoration issues because they are so beautiful and they are quite large, uh, or just honor honor honorary gifts for, let's say, officers. But in fact, uh, a recent eye study showed that uh, many of them, uh, though they were very carefully engraved and produced, uh, where the dyes were used so, such a long, for such a long time that in the end, there were more and more cracks and probably ended 
being completely broken. So the weight of those coins is absolutely perfect. The standard is followed very carefully. The model is beautiful, but it's, in the end, it's always money, and it's meant for payments, and you don't waste money uh, recarving a die as long as you have not finished uh, with the one you are using. Um, Andrew Meadows showed you that uh, it was a complex system. You have, you have some fraction. In fact, they are extremely rare. Uh, the emistator and the eight of estator are almost unknown. We have, I know, 12 emistators and only two eight of estator. The quarter were more, more frequently uh, um, issued. Uh, but uh, the bulk of the production was really, really made with the staters and uh, in lower proportion with the die staters. Um, I was telling you that uh, they are carefully uh, produced. You can see it here. Uh, the, the standard, this is a study that uh, Georges Loride made uh, on the Philips II uh, staters, but as I told you, uh, the group th two and three were produced by Alexander. He was uh, trying to find out which standard it was, and he chose uh, to, study, uh, to study it uh, coins in perfect, in mint condition, so showing absolutely nowhere uh, they were coming from holes, and you see that they completely, they perfectly fit the weight standard of 8 gram 60, which is quite remarkable for people working with uh, really elementary balances and, and, and to, uh, scales, sorry, and tools. Um, another important uh, information is that the first issues of gold uh, occurred in the, in the Levant, probably in Tarsus, just after the victory uh, on, on, um, on, on Tyre. But uh, it's, this coin it spread uh, quite quickly uh, in the rest of the empire. And in fact, we can see that uh, some of the eastern coins had Mesidian models. Uh, the bottom coin is a double stator uh, from Amphipolis in Macedonia, and uh, the engraving is particularly beautiful, with uh, some detail that we don't have in, on most of the stators, because uh, the victory on the reverse is wearing, uh, she's like dancing, you know, a peplos is open uh, around her legs, and you can see that the Sidon uh, model, uh, the Sidon engraver tried to follow the uh, uh, Macedonian model, but in a more clumsy way. Um, well, th these issues um, were um, occurred during Alexander's lifetime, but also uh, posthumously, and uh, the study of on the number of mints issuing goals with Alexander types uh, by period is, is quite uh, interesting because, in fact, uh, it conscience that it's really a war coinage. You can see that after 280, it completely drops. And in fact, uh, there is only one mint really active during that period, which is one of the uh, Black Sea mints that is just starting its issue. Uh, the other, the four other mints uh, active between 280 and 270 are in fact finishing. Um, and pursuing almost nothing. Uh, I say it's a war mint because uh, 280 is usually considered at the year marking the end of uh, the wars of the success successors. Uh, all the immediate successors uh, still alive uh, uh, at the time die in 200, 280 and then start the Hellenistic dynasties with other wars, but in completely different proportions. So this gold, most of it is really uh, specific uh, to uh, Alexander's successes. Uh, this is not to be meant to be scary. It's just a table with all the dye studies of gold that we that are now available. More or less one third of the men's uh, have benefited from a dye study. For some of them, it's not a complete dye study. For instance, in Macedonia, on the top. Uh, of the table, uh, it's only a partial uh, study of, of, of the issues. What is very interesting is that, in fact, even with a partial study, Macedonia shows that it uh, produced half of what we know uh, of Alexander, the gold of Alexander. It would probably um, be uh, balanced a little differently the day we have a complete dye study for all the mints, but uh, the, the Macedonian mints had just a tremendous output. And it shows also 
in the in the in, in the comparison between uh, the, the mints, the location of the mints, and the location of the hoard, that there is a, a real trend uh, to the north of the Aegean and particularly to Macedonia, because you have here the mint issuing gold mostly during Alexander's lifetime, and here you have the places where the, it was ordered. Uh, during Alexander's lifetime and the war of the successors, it, it's really a strong feature. And that is confirmed by the analysis of the metal that, that we've made. So here again, I, I, want, I don't want to frighten you with too technical uh, data. Uh, these are the results of uh, the uh, elemental analysis, uh, elementary analysis that we have made uh, on the gold coins of the coin cabinet in Paris. Uh, they are non-destructive and they allow us to look for trace elements, that is elements that are extremely uh, scanty in the metal but that are stable. Here typically we are looking for platinum here and palladium here. Uh, on this table, on, on this graph, you can see the results of uh, the direct, so the Achaemenid gold coinage, and the Philips issued in Macedonia, but also in other means of uh, Alexander's empire during Alexander's lifetime, and the results of uh, the studies of the gold of Alexander. The Macedonian uh, issues before 328, so are just here, it's a blue marks, and you can see that they contain almost no platinum and low palladium. We probably have here the fingerprints of uh, the Thracian uh, mines uh, of the Pangaeum uh, area, while the Daryx are all the red uh, spots, and the Alexander of the eastern part of the empire are there in a geometrical progression between palladium and platinum. It is interesting because when you add on this graph uh, the results of the issues of the Hellenistic kings, and particularly of the Seleucids in Syria and the Ptolemies in Egypt, you can see that they concentrate right in the middle here of the Eastern Alexander coinage and the Darix. So we probably have here uh, the, 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 the fingerprints of the metal of the Achaemenids uh, melted down and struck by Alexander, and then melted down again and struck uh, by his successors in the East. If you plot those results with the other ones we have for the ancient world, you can see that the geometrical progression of uh, the Eastern Gaul is still visible here. You have here the imperial gold of the Roman Empire with completely different ratio between palladium and platinum. And the big purple uh, group with a non-geometrical uh, ratio uh, in the middle is made with the Western Greek gold and Carthage gold. So uh, this is a good example of uh, how the uh, metal analysis can help us understanding what happened with the metal of the Persian kings and then of Alexander the Great. My conclusions here are uh, it's first that coins bring, bring a lot of new data, which make them quite enjoyable to study. Uh, it's also the, the world study shows also that Alexander's gold mostly comes from the Persian treasuries, as we can see, of course, uh, from text, but also from metal analysis and from hoarding. Uh, another uh, new conclusion, I may say, is that uh, Alexander issued more gold Philips than Philip II, and the successors of Alexander issued more Alexander than Alexander himself. So it's quite interesting to see how the coinage of uh, um, a famous predecessor was reused by his successors. As I told you, the Macedonian mints were the biggest gold issuers, and uh, uh, I believe it will remain true in the future, even if in lower proportions than what we have now. And uh, in the end, the partiality for gold in the northern Aegean is a very long-running feature that we can see across several centuries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederic. I'm now going to ask Simon to, uh, to come down and whisk us away to the... Uh, Far east of Alexander's empire. Uh. Um, 
I'd just like to um, reiterate um, uh, the thanks for inviting us. It's always nice to be for me to be let out of the museum to talk to people. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Professor Meadows has just said, um, I, I'm going to really shift the focus um, of, of my part of this presentation, um, both chronologically and geographically. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is, is start off by posing a question which um, will uh, be illustrated with two different maps. So this one, you, you have seen a, a, uh, an a similar example already, um, showing Alexander's campaign stretching all the way um, from Macedonia in, in the west um, to uh, India uh, in the east. Um, uh, the second, uh, which is at roughly the same scale, is uh, also similar to one you've seen before, but rather more elegant, I would say, um, showing um, lifetime and posthumous mints um, uh, with a yellow and purple colour scheme here. Um, and you will notice that there's quite a big difference here. Uh, there are, sorry, I, um, th there are lots of mints around here, but nothing at all. Uh, in this eastern area, where we know that Alexander uh, was present for quite some period of time, in fact. So, what is uh, what, what actually is 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 going on here? Um, it seems like it might be quite surprising, um, but the lack of the production of coins in in that part of the world is, is another of the ways in which Alexander actually. Um, maintained in some ways an existing system. Um, so putting it into context, um, it's always worth pointing out that uh, it, when we're dealing with this part of the world, we have a very different form of evidence from um, further west. Um, sources are much more limited. Uh, there are very few um, epigraphic, archaeological, or indeed written sources, um, certainly in the period after Alexander. And often, uh, fortunately for me, the best primary source is, is numismatic. Um, but of course, uh, coins that, even though uh, we may not like it, do have their limitations. So, um, we're fortunate to have lots of coins that survive from this part of the world, but actually we don't necessarily know where they were found. So, uh, comparing then this map, um, the evidence in this region before Alexander's arrival is, is no different at all. We have only three hordes that are uh, particularly relevant. Uh, the first one is found in Balkh, uh, which is on the map there in 1966, um, and was given a burial date of 390 uh, to 380 based on the contents. Um, all of which came from archaic and classical Greek mints surrounding the Mediterranean. Uh, the second one, uh, found in Kabul, um, is similar uh, with fewer coins altogether, but that was dated to 380 as well. Um, uh, although actually it may now be suggested that they were deposited 50 years earlier. Um, the, the second hoard found in Kabul contained uh, not only some archaic and classical coins, but also uh, Persian sigloi uh, produced by the Achaemenid Empire, as well as uh, 14 bent bar coins uh, and 29 other local coins. And um, these look really very different to anything that we have seen so far. So in, in this part of the world, there are on the left these very elongated coins with two stamps at either end. So a similar process, um, but a completely different format um, of coinage. Um, and then on the other side of the, of the slide, on the right-hand slide, uh, that's an example of a punched mark coin uh, of the kind used um, in India um, before um, Alexander's arrival as well. Uh, again, completely different, uh, a completely irregular shape uh, with lots of little punches, almost like hallmarks, uh, punched into the same surface of the coin, unclear whether they're even done in the same um, same striking or all in one go or at different, different stages. Uh, really very interesting, but very difficult to understand exactly what was going on there. Um, so that's really what coinage looks like in this part of the world before Alexander, and it's known in very small numbers. Um, there's in fact um, a, a third hoard uh, discovered in 2003 uh, in Turkmenistan um, without an actual, a more secure find spot, um, and which was recorded while it was being sold. Um, and that seems to have, have had a, a similar um, composition. Um, and it, it gives the impression that um, archaic coins uh, were able to make their way to Central Asia um, pretty quickly after they'd been struck, so there was, there was clearly uh, a significant amount of trade. Um, 
Having said that there's almost no literary sources, there is a particularly relevant uh, reference um, in Quintus Curtius, one of the Alexander historians, to uh, 80 talents of what he calls signed silver, uh, given by uh, the Indian king, uh, Taxiles, to Alexander, which may indicate that he was using some kind of coinage, but it's very unclear exactly what those words signed silver might mean. So. Um, the picture is slightly more nuanced. Alexander didn't introduce coinage to Central Asia, but uh, the enormous issue of coinage that he produced further west clearly had an, a, a great impact. Um, so, um, although it seems that coins were not actually struck under Alexander in Central Asia, we do have um, what I'm going to refer to as imitation coins, which copy his types. Um, and that raises quite an interesting question between uh, what I'm calling imitations and coins that, that um, a, a, a Professor Meadows showed you earlier on, um, which are he called posthumous issues. Um, so the coins uh, like the kind I show here first appeared in 2001 um, in a hoard that was reportedly found in Western Pakistan. Um, that hoard contained lifetime and early posthumous Alexanders as well as Seleucid and early Greco-Bactrian coins alongside these coins, which are in fact plated, so they really are trying to imitate something. They're not, they're not solid silver all the way through. Um, and this is um, the first sign of, of something that we'll see uh, more often in Central Asia, in which coin types are copied schematically, where the person engraving the dies doesn't necessarily really understand the images that they are copying, and certainly doesn't understand the, uh, the Greek legend on the, on the reverse, um, which is just really a series of blobs uh, just there. Um, so the people who produced these coins uh, presumably are unfamiliar with any tradition of coinage um, and copied what to them what had the appearance of a coin. Uh, if, you, if you don't know that there's a whole variety of coin types in the Western uh, Mediterranean, this is what a coin looks like to you and this is your approximation uh, if you're coming to make your own version of it. So um, that's really um, the, the period uh, around Alexander's lifetime, but following his death, there, there are um, quite interesting changes. Um, so we will, we will now move later in time. Um, so um, here uh, is a map of the Hellenistic world um, in the third century BC. Um, and following Alexander's death, the area in the east passed to his general, um, Seleucus. So most of this area, including what is labeled here as the Kingdom of Bactria. So uh, a slightly less colorful, but uh, more accurate map uh, showing uh, the, the uh, mints of Seleucus the first here, including Bactra and Iconum, which are in uh, Iconum in, in northeastern Afghanistan. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, after Alexander's death, Seleucus in many ways continued, uh, as did many of the successors of Alexander, uh, a lot of his policies, not least in terms of coinage. They carried on producing coins that had exactly the same designs, had Alexander's name on the back still, uh, but gradually they developed um, uh, a difference. They added their own names to the coins and they started to change um, by adding their own portraiture to them, um, with the kings uh, actually putting themselves on the obverse of the coins, and something that we're far more familiar with today. Um, and uh, although uh, this is not a coin which uh, has Seleucus I on it, it's in this transitional phase, uh, it is very interesting. Uh, it's not a coin from Central Asia, it's from Ecbatana, so a little bit further west. Um, but you'll see that Seleucus has retained this image of Heracles on the obverse, very similar to the coins that we've seen already. Uh, but particular interest for the rest of this paper um, is the fact that there is uh, someone uh, on the back. There is a figure on horseback um, wearing headgear which has horns attached to it, while the horse also has horns. Um, and there's, there's a lot of um, debate numismatically about who this person is. Is it Dionysus? Um, is it Alexander with the attributes of Dionysus? Or is it Seleucus with the attributes of Alexander and Dionysus? Um, but when you see it in the context of other coins minted by Seleucus uh, at Susa, it seems likely that this actually is supposed to be Alexander. Uh, and the horns of the horse uh, add weight to this, this conclusion. Um, Alexander's horse was one of the most famous uh, in antiquity, um, this magnificent beast with a large head, which gave him his name, uh, Bucephalus. Um, and he was won by um, a kind of 12-year-old Alexander uh, who tamed this horse. Um, which had previously been untamable because he was scared of his shadow. Um, and then the, the Bucephalus accompanied him on, on the rest of his journey. Um, 
we can presumably assume that Bucephalus in real life did not actually have horns. Uh, horses don't have horns, but um, there is literary evidence that he may have been adorned with gilded horns. So in some sense, he may actually have had some. Um, and his name by itself may have led later generations to assume that he did have horns. Um, uh, Already we've sw switched slightly weirdly away from coins and into horned horses, but um, I just thought I would break this up a little bit by uh, showing you a picture of something that wasn't a coin, uh, which my colleagues tell me is sometimes is a good idea. Um, and uh, he, we find that Bucephalus is depicted in other media, sometimes with rather unusual features. Uh, so if you will just indulge me for a little while, this is a sculpture which is outside the uh, city chambers in Edinburgh. Um, and it shows Alexander moving Bucephalus so that his back is to the sun, so that he can't see his shadow and therefore is taming him. Um, the model for this, this bronze sculpture was created by um, Sir John Steele in 1832, uh, but not cast until some 51 years later. Uh, but by which time uh, it had become clear that the city of Edinburgh was not willing to pay the artist the full amount for the sculpture. Um, the, the, the local legend of this story is that the, the artist then um, amended the design of the horse's ears um, so that, in fact, um, Steele gave him the ears of a pig. Um, uh, I, I'm not an, an expert in the anatomy of horses, I must say, but um, they, they do look a little unusual, I must say. And this is a far more realistic statu uh, uh, image where the statue is wet because it's raining in Edinburgh. So. Um, uh, that's just a, a silly aside, actually. Sorry, it was quite a long digression, but it was worth it for something that's not coins. So um, there's also a representation of, of Alexander on the, the famous Alexander mosaic from Pompeii. And here, there's, there's something a little bit strange about the ears as well. Um, that There's potential for special pleading here, but other people have suggested that what is going on here is a, a blurring between um, ears and horns on this, on this image. Um, Alexander's horse has much lighter ears than everyone else's horses in the rest of the mosaic, and they do have a slightly horn shape. Um, this is uh, worth indulging me because it will come back and become relevant in a little while, I promise. So, um, whatever the case, um, horned horses also appear on coins. Um, but produced at different mints throughout the Seleucid Empire. So this one comes from Pergamon under Seleucus I, and you will see there is very clearly um, a horse with a very nice set of horns. Um, so um, I will come back f in a little while to horned horses, um, but move back to the focus of the, of the presentation, which is Central Asia, specifically the area of, that was to become the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, which consists of modern northern Afghanistan, uh, bits of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. Um, and then there's also the later Indo-Greek kingdom, which lasted from the second century BC to the first century AD, which is further south uh, in, in northern Pakistan. Now, importantly for our purposes, um, a similar image to that horned horse that we just saw was, is found on coins from Bactria, from uh, either the, the city of Iconum or Bactria, um, produced during the reign of the Seleucid King Antiochus I. So now we've moved to this late tradition, later tradition where Hellenistic kings put themselves on one side of the coin, and on the back there's often a lot of, uh, there's a bit of freedom to choose something. You have uh, King Antiochus, uh, and there is um, a, a horned horse with really quite magnificent horns in this case. Um, this, uh, of course, is a, is a coin that comes from Iconum, a, a famous city, um, referred to by its French excavator as um, a Greek city in Central Asia, uh, remarkable for many of its features, which can be uh, assumed almost to be completely from, from a, a Greek origin. You have um, a home of the founder of the city, statuettes of Heracles, the uh, Corinthian capital, which led to its uh, initial discovery, and um, an 8,000 seat theater. Um, and its, its, its role in the history of uh, the Seleucids and the later Greco-Bactrian kingdom is unclear, um, as indeed is the history of this period really more generally, um, but it's possible to piece together a bare outline. So um, the Greco-Bactrian kingdom started around 250 BC when um, the, the former satrap, uh, governor of Bactria, Diodotus, seems to have tried to declare his independence from the Seleucids. Um, marking the beginning of what we call the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom. Uh, coins of Diodotus and his immediate successors 
uh, are of this standard Seleucid type, which is by now well established. You have a diademed and idealized bust of the king on the obverse with a deity or a, an attribute of the deity on the other side of the coin. Um, but under one of these uh, Bactrian kings, this model starts to change somewhat. So this is Euthydemus I um, on his coins, um, which are really absolutely magnificent, uh, particularly when they're blown up to that size, um, you get someone who is uh, depicted as less idealized. It's a much more naturalistic portrait. Um, people often comment on his uh, jowls, which if you're trying to idealize yourself, you do not include in a portrait. Um, and this, this level of portraiture really separates these, these Bactrian coins um, apart from, from a lot of um, other Hellenistic coinage. Um, but it's difficult to determine why, why do this, why you suddenly start to portray yourself in a very naturalistic, potentially realistic way when everyone else is um, buffing themselves up, as it were. Um, and given these features, we might assume that the images are reasonably accurate depictions of the king. Why give yourself gels if you didn't actually have them? Um, but perhaps they're designed to resonate with the, the likely users of the coins, who presumably are soldiers and who would therefore have been familiar with the portrait of the king. And we get all sorts of quite interesting developments in Bactria with these coins. So uh, it's an important point that you get distinctions between these people because uh, sometimes they have really quite outlandish things going on. Um, this chap, Demetrius I, who is the son of the previous king, Euthydemus, is shown wearing an elephant scalp helmet, um, which um, is potentially um, a helmet that he actually wore. Uh, you see that there's a line here um, that makes it clear it's something sitting on top of his head. Other people um, appear with elephant scalps on their coins, bizarrely, uh, but they have uh, a whole lot of elephant coming down the side of their head. I mean, the idea that you can sit somewhere with an elephant's head on, your, on the top of your head is absurd in the first place. But if you indulge me a little bit, um, you, you will see that there is a clear line here. So maybe this is a representation of, of something that this king wore. And there are other examples of Hellenistic kings um, engaging in this kind of uh, theatricality. So uh, Demetrius Polyocetes is reported by Plutarch to have worn cloaks which had the image of the world and, and heavenly bodies um, because he was claiming universal sovereignty. And maybe we can link something here, an elephant. There are elephants in India. Uh, this appears to be an Indian elephant. It has quite a small ear. Perhaps Demetrius had some conquests in India that this is really referring to. Although, as we've heard, linking coins and historical events is quite dangerous. Um, often you find that uh, previous Hellenistic iconography is kind of twisted somewhat. So um, here we have Pantaleon. Uh, on the back, you have an image that's reasonably familiar from earlier parts of this presentation. Zeus seating on a throne uh, with uh, a scepter in his left hand and something in his outstretched right hand. Um, but he's not holding an eagle, as we've seen from, from Alexander's coins. He's holding a uh, depiction of Hecate. Uh, who is not terribly clear on this coin, but you can see her faces, and she's holding two torches out like this. Um, something that is not known, uh, this kind of depiction is not known from anywhere else in the Greek world. Um, these coins are incredibly rare, which is why that's unfortunately not the best uh, image. Um, and you get other people who seem to enjoy a, a penchant for somewhat unusual headgear, at least in terms of Hellenistic kings on coins. So uh, we have Antimachus I here, um, who is shown with what is often uh, identified as a calcia, um, which is um, the hat which is um, uh, of Macedonian origin and is found on um, the paintings of the tomb guards at Vergina. Um, but its origin has been the subject of, of much debate. Uh, this format does seem to be quite different from, from other depictions. It's much sharper at the brim. Um, the other feature that's often picked up on is that Alexand um, sorry, Antimachus has a, a slightly cheeky, enigmatic smile, um, which is there. Uh, 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 plenty, of, plenty of images of these coins, um, and, and he has this smile. Um, what's that about? Are the Hellenistic kings don't smile on their coins. If you, if you want to look like a, a, a uh, you fit your kingship, um, looking cheeky is probably not the best way. So um, what's going on with this? Well, uh, similar features have been read with later Roman imperial portraiture, and it's been suggested that this is, um, similarly, the smile of a commander who is a hardened fighter, but affable and accessible to his men. 
Um, whether that's quite what's going on here is another matter, but it is very interesting. There are clear developments that are quite different. Um, then we have this absolutely magnificent coin, um, the, the zenith of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, um, which is assumed to have come during the reign of Eucrates I, who is responsible for this 20 state air piece. So this is um, 20 of the standard gold coin of Alexander the Great. Um, it weighs 169.2 grams, um, and it is about that big. It's the largest coin that was struck in antiquity. It is now in the collection of Dr. Frédéric Girard in Paris. Um, the king wears a Boeotian helmet of the type that Alexander's companion cavalry wore, but he's got um, a bull's horn, we're back to horns, and an ear, which is, is reminiscent from other uh, coinage uh, of the Hellenistic world. Um, and we find the Dioscuri on the back, so uh, charging right, Castor and Pollux there. We will return to that image in a little while. But the ultimate use of Alexander's legacy under the Bactrian kings was uh, under one of the kings called Agathocles, who produced um, uh, these coins, which are known as pedigree coins. Uh, we know nothing about Agathocles except for his coins. He is not mentioned in any literary sources. There is no archaeological record. There's no epigraphy for him. We just have coins. Um, here is uh, one of his, his issues, and he is copying, like for like, the images of Alexander the Great from his coins. Um, Hence the term pedigree coins, the idea being that he is suggesting his legitimacy goes all the way back to Alexander. There is a whole sequence of these which goes back through Bactrian kings and ultimately Alexander is the last person to appear. Um, the coins have also been used as evidence to suggest that the image of Alexander's obverse, which is Heracles, has been assimilated at least by this point in the second century BC with the image um, of Alexander himself. Um, so um, that's also quite interesting. There's so many of these coins around that people have started to confuse the image into actually a, a portrait of Alexander. Um, but again, this is very much one side of the story. Agathocles, the same person who is producing coins to, to uh, create a link back to Alexander, is also striking coins that look like this. Um, this has absolutely no Greek on it. Um, it has... Um, this image, which which is, hmm. oh, uh, there we go. Uh, uh, there, there is there is a, a, a railing with a tree in it, um, and on the back you have a six-arched hill with a, a, an Indian script underneath, uh, which reads Gathu Kleasa. So his his name has been um, transliterated into um, Prakrit, uh, written in the Karashti script, and the image is likely to be. Um, interpreted as the Bodhi tree, which is the image under which the Buddha gained enlightenment, the tree under which, sorry. Um, so you have someone who is, um, has a Greek name, but is, is a, a using all of this imagery from, from, from a, a different uh, background. Um, but these coins are only produced in low denominations. His, his high value coins are those um, coins with only Greek on them with nice silver. So, um, Later on in the Indo-Greek kingdom, we get these bilingual silver coins, which again are really very nice. Um, you get syncretic types. You have Zeus riding an elephant, which is an image that you don't find in the Mediterranean. Um, but here, um, there's often images that are quite Hellenistic in style. So this is Philoxenos. He's uh, got a diadem on, on the obverse, uh, with a Greek legend. And on the back, there is a figure on horseback who is normally identified as the king. And he's wearing a Boeotian helmet and he's got a diadem. Um, but it's recently been suggested that this actually is a depiction of Alexander. Um, it occupies the reverse of the coin, which is always the, 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 the side that has a god or an attribute of a god on the back. This is um, in the um, late 2nd, early 1st century BC, so we are a long way after Alexander, who has been deified by this point. And you will notice some unusual marks around the head of the horse. Uh, on this particular example, I, I, uh, which is in the Ashmolean collection, uh, I dismiss this as a flaw on the die of the kind that we saw earlier on. Um, but actually, this reverse type was used under a number of Indo-Greek kings. Um, and this is just the first example. This is Antimachus II. He's got a horse on the back. He's got Nike on the obverse, but on the back, he has someone with a Boeotian helmet, a diadem, riding a horse, which has some funny things on its head. 
Um, let's keep going. Four more coins. Uh, sorry, yes, four more coins from, from the Hebden coin room struck under different kings. And on all of these examples, you have odd horn-like shapes around the horse's head. Uh, and a final example, again, absolutely beautiful coin, um, of uh, two rulers, um, Hermias and Calliope. Um, and you have the horse with what is really quite a distinctive set of handlebar horns, I would say, here going on here, um, which is quite reminiscent of that coin that we saw from Pergamum. So um, I will hope you will agree that we're in fairly safe ground on identifying this reverse type as Alexander. So there is some kind of um, deification going on here. Um, and um, many of these features of coins introduced to the region by Alexander continued in use um, under the Kashans uh, and successive dynasties until the arrival of Islam. Uh, and now we will s s shift much further um, in time, um, just quickly, because um, even with non-pictorial types um, on the coins like this, uh, you have a one ruler um, who ruled from 1296 to 1316 who referred to himself as Sikandar Altani, the second Alexander. Um, he also defeated the Mongols and launched in expeditions uh, against them into Central Asia. So um, this is perhaps an important part of using this kind of title. And the memory and significance of Alexander, even so far removed in time at this stage, is clearly so strong and is being invoked even on coins that are of a completely different character. Um, and indeed, we don't have to look even too far uh, further than the present day uh, and very recent past to find evidence of the continued use of Greek images on currency in Afghanistan. So this banknote, uh, which is part of a series that was introduced in 2002 uh, following the, the NATO-led invasion of Afghanistan, includes the seal of the Afghanistan bank uh, on the back on the right-hand side. And that image is familiar from the greco batrian coins that I showed you earlier on. Um, and this, is, this, this image has for some time been a, a, a passing curiosity for people who study Hellenistic Central Asia. Um, the seal, for example, makes an appearance in a book called The Lost World of the Golden King, um, in which the errors of the Greek legend um, are lamented, which I think is a little bit harsh, but anyway. Um, recently, uh, however, um, Dr. Llewellyn Morgan of uh, Brasenose College in Oxford um, has published a blog post um, about this banknote trying to establish how the reverse type of Eucratides uh, came to be adopted by the National Bank of Afghanistan in 2002. Um, it, his blog created a lot of interest in Afghanistan itself um, and has provided some interesting insight into how the seal is viewed at least there or was a couple of years ago. A council member of the Afghanistan bank has even indicated that the, the design of the seal was a concern for some time in the bank when it was thought that the Greek legend had religious connections and that the image depicted the god of wealth. But once it was established that um, Megas simply means great, uh, the seal is back and acceptable again. Um, so for my part, I've actually undertaken a die study of coins of Alexander the Great, and uh, I was uh, able to identify um, the prototype coin uh, from which this seal was cre created. So um, that's the coin there um, that, that inspired this seal, I think. Um, the coin was found in 1946 as part of a hoard discovered in Kunduz in the northeast of Afghanistan. It was published by the French um, archaeological delegation in Afghanistan in 1965, and the coins held at the National Museum in Kabul, um, which unfortunately has since been looted. Um, although there are some uncertainties, I, I do hope that uh, Dr. Morgan's Afghan con contacts can clear up for us how likely it was that this coin was actually seen by the person who decided to create the seal. And no other examples from that die are known, so it, it must come from this coin. Um, and it's quite interesting to speculate why you have a Greco-Batrian coin with a Greek legend chosen to appear on banknotes that otherwise have um, an almost universal Islamic imagery or uh, depictions of um, is Islamic archaeological sites. You'd have very little from much earlier. Um, Eucrates is often thought to have been the king under whom the kingdom was at its height. Uh, particularly in the light of that enormous 20-stator gold piece. The seal may also have been designed after the discovery of Iconum, the famous city, which the excavators identified as Eucratides' capital. More simply, um, perhaps the image of that horseman was thought to be one for which Afghans would have some affinity. Um, indeed, no other Greco-Batrian coins have figures on horseback. Um, but 
whatever the case for all of this, um, I, I hope it's been interesting just to see um, just how long-lasting um, and interesting um, the integration of Alexander and his legacy in Central Asia has been. Thank you very much. So, very, very big thank you to all our speakers uh, for their informative presentations. And I'm sure we all learned a few new things today, and surely I did. So now it's your chance to ask some questions. So feel free to uh, ask them. I'm sure they're happy to answer your questions. <laughs> so I've got quite a lot, but I think I'll speak to you uh, individually afterwards. Um, I was quite intrigued to hear that uh, there were about 10 to 15,000 produced from each die uh, in terms of the series of Alexander, because um, I collect ancient coins, and in terms of uh, the Athenian tetradrachmas from about 454 to 404 BC, you rarely find the same die type. So the question is, as, uh, did the technique change a lot between 450 BC to 340 BC, say, when they were produced, uh, the Alexander types? Did they use different metals? Did they move from bronze to iron, and therefore they could produce more coins with the same die, or what happened? Um. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one, I, I guess. Um, I don't think much changed, technologically speaking. I think the reason that you're not seeing uh, many die duplicates in the Athenian series from 450 to 400, let's say, is simply that Athenian coinage was massive in that period. Absolutely colossal. It was the biggest coinage that had existed prior to the coinage of Alexander the Great. I've, I have done a die study of a part of that coinage um, from, a, from a hoard that was found in Iran, where I had, I think, about 300 coins and about 298 dies, um, which, which suggests to me that we are talking about you know, an, an enormous coinage of that period. So I, I don't think anything has changed in terms of, of quantity. Given the length of time we are talking about, uh, uh, in the case of Alexand the Alexanders, they read about 260 years, with, that's right, and. Uh, the uh, Greek drachma, the Attic Greek drachma, were probably 400 years because I think it was still used during the Roman period. Uh, now, uh, during this time, has the content of the metal been maintained or were they attempts at debasement? And uh, uh, if so, um, how do the two series of coins, that is, the Attic Drachma and the Alexanders, fare or compare? Can I hand the metal question to you? <laughs> so, so the, the question is, is, is there any obvious debasement, either, either in, let's say, the Athenian series or, or, no, or the it, Alexander? It, it, well, not, not in this series, not, not Athenian, and, and nor the Alexander. Uh, it's its specific quality of the Greek coinage that most of the time it's it's very, very high uh, silver or gold content. When I say very, very high, it's as high as it was possible to refine the metal. So when we've made this analysis on the coinage, but not only on the Alexander, we all often have 98% of gold or silver in the coin. It's some sort of sm small pure ingot. It's purer than our jewels, for instance. The debasement occurs, but in later periods, most of the time. For instance, uh, at the Ptolemies, the, at the Ptolemaic coinage, you can answer that question better than me, probably. Uh, the Ptolemaic coinage at the end of the dynasty has debasement. In certain circumstances, we have debasement, but it's remains rather limited in the Greek world. The debasement is mostly a phenomenon of the Roman Empire. Do we have any, any knowledge of the silver content of what's going on in Afghanistan? Uh, yes, we, we, we know that the silver content was equally high. Um, so 99, 98% silver, as, as pure as they could get it. Um, so, so absolutely no debasement. So the message is you could trust the Greeks, but you couldn't trust the Romans. <laughs> Um, I was curious about the dyes. Um, I mean, it must have been very different producing bronze coins, for example, which would have been much harder than the gold, which, as we just heard, was very pure. Um, uh, do, do we know what the dyes were made of and what tools we used to cut them? Yes, very hard bronze most of the time. Um, the thing is that most of the Greek dyes of Greek coins that, we, that are 
available, for instance, uh, in auctions or even in collections are forgeries. Uh, there is mm, maybe two or three dies that are probably genuine. Uh, these ones are all in very hard bronze. That means that the proportion of tin is important. So one quarter of it was tin and the low content of, uh, of lead. So that also means that where they could be broken because that, that makes an alloy that is hard and breakable. That explains the cracks you've seen on the coins, for instance. Uh, although any die ends cracking. <laughs> so, um, the the um, um, iron uh, could be used uh, but it's mostly a, phen a later phenomenon. Uh, for instance, in the Celtic world, uh, there are lots of uh, iron, in, in even steel uh, dyes. Well, we, we don't know the tools because we never found um, a, a workshop. And, uh, and unfortunately, our literary sources doesn't speak about that. Uh, what is generally um, thought is that uh, it's the same tools as uh, a um, gem engraver. And uh, we have more data about that because, uh, for instance, Pliny the Elder uh, described the tools used by gem engravers. And in fact, those tools have not changed for a very, very long time. The traditional ways of engraving gems today still use the same tools. Any questions? I have two questions. <laughs> okay, so the first uh, is, we know that the Alexandra world was, some describe it as proto-capitalist. It was the kind of beginning. I, I would like you to, to tell us your opinion about this and how how extensive the use of coinage was in this in this environment. Uh, was it uh, why would would it be so important for them to stamp and produce this kind of coinage in the ancient world before Alexander and after? And the second question, a silly thing, silly uh, thought of mine maybe, uh, but I try to relate it technologically. You probably know. If an ancient civilization is able to mint and to use this kind of metallurgy to mint and massively produce coins, why was there no printing press in ancient world? I always connected those two things. Was there no printing press? Uh, printing uh, press. Uh, you work in a library, I think you can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> printing press. Um, I think uh, I can answer the, um, the purpose of coinage, though. Yeah. Um, Excellent. I, I think, yes. Um, <laughs> you can think. To you. Okay. Um, so I, I think certainly Alexander, Alexander's purpose, as you've seen, is, is to pay his debts. Um, and a lot of the, the work that, that I've done, um, certainly at Damascus, uh, as, as you kindly mentioned, uh, shows that there is just absolutely frantic production of coinage. Um, you capture the metal, you strike it as fast as possible into coinage, and then you move on. And that's the, a lot of the pattern, at least while he's alive and, and, and during the, a lot of the conquests. Um, later on, I think you can make quite a clear argument that a lot of the coinage is being used by the successors to, to fund their, their warfare as well. Um, that is certainly the, the explanation that, that, that is given um, by most people. Um, whether there is... Literary sources are quite difficult on this as well, I think. You, you can... Um, maybe assume that things are, are being paid in different ways and uh, is everything that's being charged at a particular value actually being paid in coin is, is a problem. Um, but I think certainly um, Bactrian kings produce coins um, that, that show them as, as um, military men because they are going straight to soldiers. You need the soldiers to stay loyal so that you can remain king. Um, that's maybe a, something of an oversimplification, of oversimplification, but I think that's a lot of the root of a lot of what it is. I don't know. Just, just to clarify, so there was not a currency-based economy like we have now? Um, I'm, oops. Well, it, it, it's still coinage and it, it, it's, a, it's a medium of exchange that is much easier than chopping up bits of, of gold. Mm. But it, if you are the issuing authority, I think your initial um, reason to produce it is to make payments. Um, I don't know, yeah, maybe. The, the, and the, the, I see. You know, the, you know, the thing is that uh, you, you've seen the weight gold I showed in, on my first slide. It's much easier to count your gold or your silver than to weight it. It's, it's quicker. And that means that it introduces a relationship of trust between the users and the issuer. 
So it's easy to do that when you are uh, at the head of a army, an, an army, and you are leading them to a conquest, and you, you show you, you show your money. You know, uh, I would not use the word capitalistic for Alexander or anything ancient, in fact. <laughs> Let me let me let me go back to this. I'm not talking about paper money. I'm talking about this this kind of technology. You obviously explained that to mark and mint is, although it's labor intensive, it seems to me that's that's where it comes from. I always thought maybe why did you why did you did you want to go through this whole process? But you uh, you just said that it was just easier to mark it rather than weigh it. That's also a labor intensive process that didn't come to my mind. But now the second thing is having that technology. Uh, I don't know if this is your field of study. I was bugged me in a way, uh, wondered why, if these were quite advanced technologies, why didn't they do this for at least, not books, at least uh, print things. Uh, they had seals, they had mints. So I thought they have this kind of mass production, but they never thought of doing this with inscriptions or um, a kind of ancient leaflets. I don't know, maybe it's a, just a silly uh, con it's, conjecture. It's, it's, it's not my field at all, and this might be rather a glib answer, but one, one reason might be that they had no paper. Uh, yeah, but uh, if, if I may, uh, what, you, what you are mentioning is that, uh, I, I'm not sure if the, the, my English would be correct there, but in French it would be called scriptural money. I mean, it's not, you don't need to print that. They have it. They use credit, and quite a lot. And, and, and much more credit than coinage, in fact. It's why we've all, the three of us, say that, in fact, coinage is related to war. Because it's very different when you have to pay an army. And if I may, I first misunderstood what you said because I, I, I wondered if you were wondering why there were not mechanical way of producing coins which are much faster and more efficient. But that's, that's not efficient in the case of a campaign like Alexander's one because, in fact, he issued coinage all along uh, a strip to the east, and, and, and the, the way the, the produced coin was very light, in fact. You can carry it with you and produce coins every night if you want. It's not that difficult. By the way, I've done it. We had experiments to try to do it. It's, and even for, for someone like me, who is not a, at all a, a metallurgist, you, you can learn to do it in a couple of hours. It's quite efficient. What I remember of the map, there seemed to be a concentration of mints on Cyprus and uh, around Tyre. Is there any particular reason for that, or is it just where the excavations were made and uh, uh, revealing these mints? Uh, no, the, the mints are deduced from the coins themselves, so it's not a pattern that's produced by archaeological excavation. I think, in part, the answer may lie in prior patterns of production. Um, that's to say, where coinage had been needed in the past, it continued to be produced. And the two areas we're talking about here are areas that are essentially controlled by sea or associated with large navies. And navies are one of the things that generates a need for coinage and, and perhaps even uh, at, at the very origin of coinage, it may, it may be in naval activity that first brings coinage to, to the Greek world. So I think, I think that's, to my mind, seems to be one, one, one clear reason why there's a lot, but you're, you're, you're the, the Levantine expert. But, <laughs> well, um, there is no easy answer to it. It's true that there is already a um, um, tradition of issuing coins in, in all this means. Uh, we, we have to remember that uh, the, the Levant, like the Greek world, is the city world. Uh, cities started there. And uh, coinage is really useful when you are uh, managing a city, especially when you need to pay soldiers, but also when you have uh, technicians. 
uh, and especially technicians you can uh, have to invite from abroad. Uh, it's interesting because we don't have many texts about the use of coinage, but it's very clear that uh, it was often used even on later periods, during later periods, to, to pay those technicians or in engineers, uh, doctors, people like that, um, artists. I'm not sure I answer completely the question. But, uh. On Cyprus, there seemed to be uh, two periods where they were producing these coins. Again, is there any particular reason why they, they, uh, they evolved like that? Uh, Cyprus is a highly contested area in the successor period. Yeah. So the, the Ptolemaic uh, Kingdom of Egypt is desperate to keep hold of Cyprus because it is the key to the naval control of the Eastern Mediterranean. And at the same time, the Antigonid dynasty who are essentially a, a naval-based dynasty in the, uh, in, in the late fourth century, are very keen to take Cyprus away. And one of the great uh, naval battles is fought off Salamis in uh, 3065 BC. And that's with the conquest of Cyprus is when the Antigonids first declare themselves to be kings. So I think, I think it is this contested nature of this space that probably leads to a lot of this coin production. Yeah, and you can say exactly the same for Phoenicia. Uh, there, there are huge, huge battles, and, and, and it's, it's quite interesting to see how the, for instance, Ptolemy from Egypt try to uh, conquer this area because it's a buffer area uh, for Egypt. Once you've taken a Phoenicia on the south of Levant, you enter Egypt, there, there is nothing to, to stop you. So it's, in the history of the long term history of Egypt, it always was a contested and, and desirable area. So the more you've war, the more you've coined. Right. Uh, my question is, um, how did people at the time know that the coin was a genuine coin produced by the king? I mean, was there any type of counterfeiting or how did they know that it was a valid coin? Okay. Um, so um, you can uh, weigh the coin first of all, to check that it's a reasonably a close approximation. Um, you can um, test your coins using a touchstone, um, which is not particularly easy um, to, to gauge just how pure the metal might be. Um, and, but a lot, of the, a lot of what goes on is, is plating of coins, I think, um, which is very clear. Um, and indeed, you will find that a lot of the Alexander coins that come f are found in Egypt um, have uh, chisel marks in them where they've been cut mm -hmm. Um, sometimes almost all the way through to make it clear that it is silver all, all the way through the coin so that it's not a plated core. Um, so th th there are um, quite easy ways to, to, to um, create these, these forgeries. Um, and indeed, why not? If everyone knows that this, this kind of coin is, is the, the accepted currency, you may as well have a go. Uh, but you, uh, as you see, the, 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 artistic style is, the artistic standard is quite high. Uh, you need someone who, who knows what they're doing to engrave um, a dies that will create something that is, is passable. Um, I mean, you saw the coin from, from Pakistan. That, that's clearly not something that would be confused for um, that beautiful uh, amphipolis tetradram. Um, that, that Andy showed us. So um, I think uh, that's uh, quite a long answer, and I hope I've covered everything that you asked, yeah. but I don't know if Frederick will help. But I know, just there are funny stories about plated coins, and curiously, uh, the ancient could plate even tiny coins. I've seen uh, the Phoenician produced extremely small coins, uh, under one gram sometimes, and, and even smaller than that. And we, we have in, in the East, a plated coins that are half of a gram. So it's probably the work of the work, the, the mint itself. It, it's not really a forgery. And generally it's considered because it, you, 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 earn no money, you earn no money doing that. But probably uh, the mint master had um, an amount of silver to strike. He didn't manage very well. And as he has a number of coins to, to produce with this amount of silver, well, it, it cheats a little with the last one because there is not, not enough metal left. And the second thing is that in the coin cabinet, we, we, a colleague of mine was um, performing analysis on uh, tetradrams uh, of the Ptolemy's silver tetradrams. 
all very good one because it's, it's, it's a royal collection in Paris. So we have beautiful coins, well caps, and so on. And the method we use, in fact, use a laser that creates an ablation in the coin. It's tiny. You couldn't see it with your naked eye, but it goes quite deep. And you have immediately the results on, on, the, on the laptop while the machine is performing the, uh, the analysis. And so you had 98% of silver, 98%, 98%. And suddenly, silver just dropped like that, and copper rose. You had a plated coin. We just never knew it. And we would never have known it hadn't we performed the analysis. It was perfect. Hello. Um, could you please give us an idea about what is the, the current market for these coins and maybe some values? Uh, the, uh, the market uh, currently for these coins um, is enormous. Uh, there are thousands probably of uh, Alexanders and posthumous Alexanders on the market every year. 99% uh, of those probably are uh, the result of uh, illegal excavation and looting in different parts of the world. One area, and um, Frederic and, and Simon have done more work on this than I have, but of course one area that's, that's yielding a very large number of these, of these at the moment uh, is Syria and the areas around Syria where there is warfare going on, where there is a lot of high explosive going off, a lot of earth is moving, um, and, and in those circumstances, hordes of coins are found. So the, the market in, in, in certain areas is, is, is bigger than it's ever, ever been, and this, this tends to follow, and, 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 and both Simon and, and Frederic have shown this, so I shouldn't be answering this question, but where we have instances of modern warfare, the coinage from that part of the world just shoots up on the market. It's just heartbreaking, I must say, to study this. But uh, very interestingly, uh, Simon and I are both from the same sort of researchers at the same time. I was working on Syria and Simon uh, on Afghanistan. And it's very interesting because um, I, I, I've started, well, I finished my first work um, the day uh, the Arab Spring started in Tunisia. So I had the result before that. Uh, and very clearly, you could see that the, war, the different wars of the Middle East showed an increase uh, in the coins found uh, in very high proportions. Uh, and it tended to drop uh, when the Arab Spring started. And since then, the market just blew up. It, it's really outbreaking because everything is coming from illegal excavation. You could say a word maybe about uh, the war in Afghanistan about that. Yes, so um, I, I undertook a, a die study of, of these coins from Afghanistan, which makes it very clear, to, it makes it very easy to say when a coin first appears on the market. Um, and uh, as has been said, if you map that on a graph, you will find that in Afghanistan there is a peak in 1993, which is the start of the Afghan Civil War, and the looting of the, um, the Kabul Museum, which was destroyed in a missile attack. Um, and there are then enormous peaks around about 2002. So um, when, when there is a, a NATO troop presence in Afghanistan, the, the numbers are absolutely through the roof. These, all of these coins have appeared. Um, interestingly, Afghanistan, the Soviet presence makes no difference at all. There are almost no coins from the, from the period of the 1980s. Um, which is, is interesting, and, and uh, I had a picture up there at one point of I Canoom the city, and the, in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide I had a, um, a, a, a map um, of the Acropolis of I Canoom and the, the lower area, the administrative quarter. Um, the Acropolis was used as a um, Northern Alliance gun emplacement um, in the uh, Afghan war, uh, and the Acropolis, and the, sorry, and the administrative quarter is now covered in um, test pits um, dug by um, illegal looters about one in uh, one every 30 centimeters. Um, uh, uh, if, you, if you go on and look at a satellite photograph, you can see and it's, it's absolutely de devastating for this site. We, we almost certainly have no idea what, what they found. And they clearly were finding things. If you're going with a metal detector, you don't dig a hole unless it beeps. So um, something has probably come out of every one of those holes. Um, and a lot of those things are coins, and we will never know where they came from. Um, all I can do is tell you that lots of them have appeared for sale, um, which is 
so sad. Yeah. I, I had an appointment th three weeks ago uh, with the, uh, the French customs uh, because they need our help uh, because they say they see so many coins that are, they are just overwhelmed and don't know how, how to deal with it because they are serial objects. Uh, it's very different from um, a painting or a sculpture. It has no unique identity, and uh, if there is not a previous picture, you can't identify a coin having that coin. It's just a series. And, and we are trying to, to build tools. There is currently a, a, a big European grant running uh, and gathering several European countries, including Cyprus, uh, to, to try to create tools between uh, enforcement um, services and uh, archaeologists and I um, and Andy and I are, are working with them to try to see how, how we can help and, and try to do something like that but it's still uh, digging a mountain with a teaspoon I'm afraid okay, we have maybe time for one more question yeah. oh, I think we have two Hi. okay Just a question about who was deciding to put the portrait of the king on a, on a coin. Was it the king himself or was it someone in the province or in the city? Because I know there's a lot of discussion around this in the Roman Empire from Augustus onwards. But what about the Alexander tetragrams? What about uh, those types of coins? I mean, what do we know about that? So Alexander the Great never put his own portrait on his coins. Um, we, can, we, we can say that with, with, with a reasonable degree of certainty. Uh, the first portraits uh, of living kings appear in the generation afterwards. Uh, so the first generation of successors begin to put portraits on their coins. None of those are straightforward portraits. They almost all have some sort of divine attribute. So these are appearing as, as divine men. Whose decision that was uh, is, I think, impossible to say. And this is, this is often the case with ancient coins where we, we happily assume that if it appears on the coin, then the king wanted it. That seems like a reasonable assumption, um, but I'm not aware that we can actually prove that. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, well, in, in, when I was showing the mints of the Greek world, saying, well, the Greek world's is, is larger than the Greek world. Why do we call it Greek coinage? Because most of the, um, the, the people that were not Greek by education adopted coinage in the Greek way. And one of the um, unwritten rules is that you don't put a, a, a living being on it. Uh, so most of the time we've got, we have objects that are symbolic of um, a city, of a people. In the, among the very first human portraits, we have Persian satraps. Uh, so it comes from foreign culture, in fact. Um, okay, yeah, I think we've reached our half an hour minute, but, uh, half hour mark for questions. So thank you very much all for coming, and we hope to see you again in our future events from next year. And a big thank you to our speakers for coming tonight and speaking to us and give us all this useful information. Uh, thank you very much and good night.